This video is going to discuss the different conditions and methodologies in which chemicals will react. Uh, of course, different chemicals behave differently from one another uh, in terms of reactions, and we're going to go through a few different types of reactions and talk about how these chemicals can behave differently and how these reactions can turn out. Being able to predict the products of a chemical reaction is actually very useful, both in a lecture setting and in a laboratory setting. So let's dive right in. The first type of reaction we're going to talk about is synthesis. And synthesis reactions take two things and make them one thing, or more than two things and make them one thing. So a really good format way to write this is just A plus B yields AB. And we can take the classic synthesis reaction almost as an example. We can make some water, right? So that is a synthesis reaction. Has added that it's also a combustion reaction, but we'll get there. So just like we can put something together, we can also break it apart. So we can actually just do the reverse of our synthesis reaction, where we can go AB yields A plus B. Now, we have to do something in this reaction, you know, whether it's adding water, whether it's adding it to an organic solvent like diethyl ether or dichloromethane, or we are adding something like heat or taking away heat. You know, we can't just take something at room temperature, put it in a flask and say go and then magically decompose it. So I'm going to show you an example reaction. And by the way, these little example sections, I'm just going to show you one reaction. Of course, there's many. Um, but I'm just going to show you one reaction of what this kind of looks like written out in a chemical, you know, as a chemical process. So we're actually going to do the decomposition of potassium chlorate. Right? And that's a solid. I'm going to erase that and write that better. Boop. There we go. Right? So it's going to give me two KCLs. Actually, no. Two KCLs in solid and three O2 in gas. And when you're writing these reactions, this is a perfectly acceptable way to write it. Personally, I'm going to go one step further and go ahead and put a delta over the arrow. That implies that I'm adding heat. Implies that I'm adding heat. Or you could just simply write heat. A single replacement reaction is where we have a compound reacting with some random single item. You know, so for sake of argument, we're going to go AB plus C yields, and I'm doing it in the wrong color, yay, AB plus C yields CB plus A. And when you're doing this, you're always talking about cation replacement. So we refer to the replacement as cations. Um or as cations uh, switching around to different anions or going just to a lone solid state, we can take a reaction example where we have some aqueous zinc chloride. Wow, that was painful. Sorry, sorry. AQ plus some copper metal to give me copper chloride aqueous plus zinc solid. And this is actually a different and this is actually an example of a different type of reaction as well that we're going to go over later. Um, but let's just go back and now we have double replacement. This is the most common type of reaction that you're going to see, um, or at least one of the most common between double replacement and acid base neutralization. So we're going to do the classic AB plus CD yields you guessed it, right? So the way we do this is this cation will come and have a reaction, or at least these will break apart, right? 
and A and D will come together, B and C will come together. And we'll learn a lot of different ways to tell how that happens. But for now, that is the regular kind of run-of-the-mill example. You know. And then we can do an example of a double replacement reaction, actually. Um, so we'll just do a real quick one. Uh, I don't know if we've talked about this before, but we'll do a lead iodide precipitation reaction um, where we start with some... lead nitrate. Let's zoom in so I can write this better for you guys. So it is not as cringy. So let's start with some aqueous lead nitrate. We'll add in two equivalents of potassium iodide and I said equivalents but a two molar ratio is fine. We're going to precipitate some lead, lead iodide in a solid form. And if you'll see why, because the lead's here, iodine's here. And we'll actually learn solubility rules in a minute, but lead halides do not dissolve in water. So they precipitate out as a solid. So this double replacement reaction can also be called a uh, single or a uh, precipitation reaction. And then potassium nitrate, very soluble, just stays in water. Combustion. Um, this one, actually, I think by now everyone probably has talked about in their general chemistry course. If not, we'll do a really, really quick uh, example. We have our fuel plus O2 yields CO2 plus H2O. And in this case, we're talking about hydrocarbon fuel. So know that I'm talking about just some of the C's and H's in it. We'll do a very basic example. CH4 Wow Right, so we have this reaction and this is actually what's happening inside your Bunsen burners in lab, right? So those gas nozzles um, they spout methane, you're reacting that with oxygen and burning it to give you CO2 gas and H2O liquid. Liquid. Okay, now this is just my personal preference and what I've been taught. Um, if your professor, teacher, what have you, uh, course supervisor, whatever you may have, um, prefers that you write to H2O gas, check with them. Please don't use my video as a gold standard, but that is a correct way of writing it. You could write H2O gas. I choose to write liquid because actually the droplets will condense very quickly and, and it'll be H2O liquid. Acid-base neutralization is the last type of reaction. And I'm actually going to give you more of a, an easy way to memorize it uh, rather than like a literal, you know, regular A plus B SW kind of thing. I'm just going to write the words out so it's not confusing. So the, the format that we use is an acid plus a base yields a salt, and it's a neutral salt, okay? Not like a literal salt, but if it precipitated out, it would be a salt plus water. And then the classic example, we're going to take our HCl, react it with NaOH, which is a strong base, and we're going to yield NaCl and H2O liquid, All right? So we took our hydrochloric acid, reacted it with sodium hydroxide to give us sodium chloride and water. So those are the different types of reactions. And it's valuable just to kind of be able to look at, an, a, re, look at a reaction and know what's happening inside the flask or know what's happening uh, in the hypothetical question if this is asked in lecture. And so that is kind of why we took the 10 minutes to go through that. Now we're going to get into predict predicting products. And this harkens back to me saying double replacement reactions are the most kind of common frequent reaction you're going to see. Why? Because they're precipitation reactions. Um, so let's do this example together. Uh, we're going to take some aqueous sodium nitrate and react that with aqueous copper 2 chloride. 
Okay, remember, copper is a transition metal. When you're writing the names of transition metal ionic compounds, okay, you want to always, always, always indicate the charge on that transition metal or the oxidation state, right? So let's take uh, aqueous sodium nitrate. So if we recall from nomenclature, that's just NaNO3, right? plus some CuCl2 aqueous, and that produces what, right? So pause the video and see if you can tell me, or just say in your mind, uh, <laughs> um, what is going to happen in this reaction? What are we going to produce? I'll just, I'll give you this though. That should be there. So in this reaction, we're going to do this just like the example double replacement. Our NAs and CLs will come together. Our NO3 and Cu will come together. So we're going to go to, oops, to NaCl aqueous plus Cu NO3 to aqueous. Now, I know what you're thinking, you know, back in that example on this page, we actually had an instance where we made a solid, where we changed um, changed phase. And phase changing is kind of what we deem as proof that a reaction occurred uh, in chemistry. So on this side, right, we have, I keep doing this, we have aqueous ions, and we make aqueous ions, right? So we have little sodiums flowing around, little nitrates, little coppers, and little chlori chlorides, excuse me. Um, and if it goes from aqueous ions floating around in solution to aqueous ions floating around in solution, did anything really happen? Okay, and the answer to this is no. So what we can conclude about this reaction, uh, and this is how you would write it on a test, or at least for the students that are in my class. Um, wow, painful. So you'd write your two sodium nitrates plus your copper two chloride. And after that arrow, you're just gonna write N dot R, no reaction, right? Nothing happens. Right. So how do we tell if something does happen? Okay. So how did I know that these two aqueous reactants yielded these two aqueous products? I use something that we call solubility rules and solubility rules tell us how readily something will dissolve in water. Um, and there are solubility rules for organic compounds as well. Uh, you'll get there eventually, but let's just talk about water. <laughs> uh, if something is soluble, that means that it dissolves in water. If a soluble product is produced, it will just stay in solution. So it'll keep that little AQ subscript, aqueous meaning dissolved in water, right? If something is insoluble, it means it does not dissolve in water. If an insoluble product is produced, it will precipitate out of the solution as a solid, just like our lead iodide did over here. So, how do we tell, so the, the whole goal is to determine whether an ionic compound will be soluble, right? And this allows us to analyze a set of reactants to make a conclusion as to whether a chemical reaction will occur or whether we'll just have aqueous ions turning into aqueous ions, right? So we're, we can determine this by the charges of the cation and anion, right? So if we just have a cation that has a one plus charge, and I'm just going to write it as plus because no one ever writes one plus, and an anion charge that's just one minus, right? This is kind of like sodium chloride, right? So NaCl, does that dissolve in water? Turns out it does. Um, so we say that uh, ionic compounds with a cation charge of plus one and an anion charge of minus one are always soluble. Okay. If we have a cation charge still of plus one and an anion charge, let's say, of two minus or three minus, actually gonna make that two minus look a little bit better, 
but if we have 2 minus or 3 minus, it turns out that it's still soluble. Right? So let's just do the next one, then I'll kind of explain where this is coming from. So let's just flip these two scenarios. Let's say we have a 2 plus or 3 plus cation and a minus 1 anion still soluble. Okay, now this is in most conditions. There are a couple exceptions on the next page that we'll get to in a moment. But what you need to conclude from this table is if either your cation or your anion is just a minus 1, right? Here they're both minus 1. This one cation is minus or plus 1. Sorry, cations are not minus 1. Whoops. Uh, <laughs> so if they just have a charge of 1, your compound's going to be soluble. Okay, the only way that these compounds are insoluble is if they have a big positive charge and a big negative charge coming together to make their compound. That will then precipitate out of solution as a solid, right? And by big, I mean more than one. So we have 2 plus or 3 plus, 2 minus, wow, ouch, 2 minus or 3 minus. insoluble. And I don't really know why I have this last line here. We're just going to get rid of that. Like it should have been in black. Okay. So that table is a good thing to memorize. We have some exceptions to standard solubility rules. Um, the sulfate anion really likes dissolving in water. So anything bonded or bonded with sulfate dissolves in water. Uh, a, good way to, a good way to remember this is that sulfuric acid is a thing, right? Um, so the sulfate obviously is dissolved in water. Um, but if, even for something like copper two sulfate, it is soluble in water. Uh, you can actually find that at like Lowe's and Home Depot is root kill. Um, and it does dissolve in water. i tell you, um, just a few transition metal halides that are insoluble. Um, there are other rules for this as well, but as far as your course goes, you'll only really see silver, lead, and mercury. Um, most hydroxides are slightly soluble. Uh, if you've ever... So if you work in the stock room or you make your own reagents in lab or something, you'll notice that sodium hydroxide dissolving in water is actually like a ridiculously exothermic process, right? Yeah. So when this happens, uh, it's really hard to get it to start dissolving, but once it does, it just kind of goes. Um, for the sake of this argument, soluble or slightly soluble is fine. Okay, you can make very high concentrations of hydroxides. It's just not like if you throw a pellet of sodium hydroxide in water that it'll disappear as quickly as salt. Okay, so that's just something to know. Um, so let's try uh, another reaction. Uh, we have potassium carbonate. So if you don't remember, that is just K2CO3. Results reacts with a solution of aluminum chloride. Wow. Which is just Al. Cl3. So let's write that out. K2CO3 aqueous plus AlCl3 aqueous yields, right? And we're just going to take these two things and we're going to do our regular Okay, our regular double replacement reaction routine where A reacts with D, B reacts with C, right? I will help you though, uh, really quick. There does need to be a three in front of K2 and there does need to be a two in front of ALCL3, okay? And this is going to give me, right, Al2CO3, three, and that's a solid. Why? Because aluminum is a 3 plus cation. We know that because it takes 3 chlorides to balance it out. Chloride's a minus 1. Carbon or carbonate is a 2 minus anion. Big positive charge, big negative charge. Precipitates out of solution real fast. And then we need 2 aluminums and 3 carbonates to balance out those charges. What have I done? So, when writing it again, you're going to go Al... Subscript 2 to indicate that there's two of them, not a coefficient 2. CO3, 3, solid, plus, now we have 6 potassiums, 6 chlorides, so we're going to go 6 KCl aqueous. That is the reaction, and in this case, we can see that since we have 
a species or a chemical pro- or chemicals with a property that precipitate out of water, we can say that a reaction occurred, right? Now, there's two other ways to write chemical reactions. If you haven't heard about them already, we'll go over them lickety-split. Uh, the complete ionic re- reaction is everything written as ions on the reactant side. And then if you produce a product, it's not in ions anymore, right? If it's a solid, right, that whole thing has a charge of zero. So you write it as a solid. And you write everything else as ions that were just your spectator ions, right? So overall reactions, compounds split into ions. If a product is produced, it must be written as the solid product because it's not ions when it's solid, right? Okay, so let's write the complete ionic reaction for this. And it's going to be really aggravating because it's long, um, but it's good experience. So let's just take our first compound, right? When K2CO3 dissolves in water, right? We're going to get 6K plus, wow, that was cringy, right, plus 3CO3, 2 minus, right? Now, I'm not going to write that out for every single one, right, but you're going to be able to see that's what I'm doing. So I'm just assuming the hydrolysis reaction for these ionic compounds, okay, and then writing it. So we're going to go with our 6 K plus, should look like a K, plus 3CO3, 2 minus, plus 2Al3 plus, plus 6Cl minus. Now, we need to keep our Al2CO3, wow, let's rewrite that. Al2CO3 3 as a solid because it is a solid. It is not ions anymore, right? And then we go our 6K plus aqueous plus 6Cl minus aqueous, right? Now, those K pluses and Cl minuses stay aqueous and they stay ions because if you'll notice, they're still aqueous in solution. So our K plus and Cl minus don't necessarily react, but we call those right, right, we call those things spectator ions, ions that do nothing, or ions that spectate, we'll make it fun, okay, <laughs> no, that's a really redundant, uh, redundant definition, ions that don't react, Right, so if they're aqueous on the reactant side, aqueous on the product side, nothing happened, right? We went from aqueous ions to aqueous ions, like our previous reaction example, nothing happened, okay? Now, the last type of way to write the reaction is called our net ionic reaction, okay? And this is going to show only the ions that produced your project, or pro- project, ha, product that changed state, right, or phase, right? So, we want just... Right, so we need our aluminum and our carbonate. We want just our 2Al3 plus and our 3CO3 2 minus, right? So we are going to go 2Al3 plus aqueous. Wow, I wish that 3 looked better. I really don't know if that was an improvement. Uh, <laughs> plus our 3CO3 2 minus aqueous. Cringe. Yields, right? And then we have our Al2CO3. Three. Solid. Okay, and that is how you write your net ionics, right? So ions on the reactant side, solid on the product side. Why is it the net ionic? Because we've taken away the spectator ions. Right? We've taken away the spectator ions. So, we're going to go two more reaction practice problems just so uh, you guys can get the hang of doing these. These are a really good test question uh, for any chemistry course, to, uh, no, no matter who your professor is. Um, so, I'm going to give, just if you'd like to pause the video uh, to work on this problem by yourself first, please do. Uh, solution of lead to carbonate is allowed to react with aqueous barium sulfate. So, uh, if you'd like to pause the video and work on that yourself, please do so now. 
Okay, so uh, hopefully if you pause the video, um, you started out by at least writing the correct compounds, right? So PbCO3 aqueous would be your lead carbonate plus your barium sulfate, so just BaSO4 aqueous right and then we do our typical double replacement routine where we bring a and d together and b and c together right so and i'm just using that right a b plus c d yields a d plus b c right so that's what i'm talking about when i'm saying bringing a and d together b and c i'm not talking about letters in a particular element so yeah that's good information um so we'd have our wrong color B A C O three solid and our P B S O four aqueous. Okay, and remember sulfate likes to dissolve all the time, so it does not precipitate out of solution. Barium carbonate, however, has a two plus charge on barium, two minus charge on carbonate, big positive, big negative. That will precipitate out of solution. So let's get our complete ionic uh, reaction here. I want to write it a little bit smaller. <laughs> Complete ionic reaction, right? So we have our Pb2 plus aqueous plus CO3 2 minus aqueous plus Ba2 plus aqueous plus SO4 2 minus aqueous, right? Because we're all aqueous on the reactant side. Then we have our arrow. Right, and then we see that we have our two plus charge on barium, our two minus charge on carbonate, so we get our BaCO3 solid plus our Pb2 plus aqueous plus our SO4 two minus aqueous. Wow, gross. Aqueous, right? So our net ionic reaction, we want only our barium and our carbonate, so we take Ba. 2 plus aqueous plus CO3 2 minus aqueous gives you your BA gross gross BA much better CO3 solid so hopefully that's what you wrote down if you uh, took uh, a couple minutes and tried the problem on your own if not uh, a couple places that I would make sure you look to see if you made any mistakes. Mistakes? Wow. Any mistakes <laughs> is, number one, did you put any numbers in front of these in your reaction? Because none go there. Lead's 2 plus, carbonate's 2 minus, barium's 2 plus, sulfate's 2 minus. Everything balances out itself. Um, your complete ionic reaction, okay, please make sure if something happened there that you separated your lead and your sulfate on the product side because they never change from being two plus and two minus ions. Remember though that sulfate in this case does not dis or does not precipitate, sorry, does not precipitate out of solution because it does dissolve in water, right? So that's what we need to remember here. Your net ionic, please remember that you need to include aqueous, aqueous, and solid. Yes, we all know what you mean. You still need to write it down. So that being said, uh, we have one more reaction practice problem, right? Aqueous potassium nitrate reacts with a solution of copper one by sulfate. So uh, take a moment and try this by yourself if you'd like to. I'll give you a couple seconds of a pause. Okay, so if you'd like to, first of all, if you try this by yourself, good job. Uh, I hope you got it right, so we're going to find out just now. Uh, if not, though, and you're using this like more of a lecture style video, um, here we go, so we're gonna do this problem. Uh, and we're gonna start with our aqueous potassium nitrate. And we're gonna go our copper one by sulfate. All right, and by sulfate or by carbonate just means you're tacking a hydrogen onto that anion, right? So, uh, so now let's just do our reaction. Let's follow our normal procedure for double replacement reactions where A reacts with uh, D, B reacts with C. So we get our CuNO3 aqueous 
plus potassium bisulfate, which is also aqueous, right? And you'll see actually in this situation, right, we have the same thing, aqueous ions yielding aqueous ions. And when we have that kind of situation, remember that we don't have a reaction that actually happens. So am I gonna make you write out the complete ionic reaction? No. Okay, if you need to do that to prove to yourself that these are all aqueous ions and they stay aqueous ions, right, remember that we're using copper 1 bisulfate. So not copper 2 bisulfate, but still bisulfate is just regular minus 1. It is not 2 minus 3 minus. So since there's no reaction, there's no net ionic reaction. Again, if you were writing this on an exam, you could just write the KNO3 aqueous plus the CuHSO4 aqueous. You're going to put your little arrow saying yields, and then you're going to say no reaction. So those are two practice problems that are both very, very probable to pop up on really any exam, right? So you have to know your solubility rules for both, okay? You need to be proficient in that stuff for both. So let's move on to a different type of reaction, and uh, it's, it's kind of also a double replacement reaction depending on the acid and base you have, but we're going to talk about acid-base neutralization reactions. And acid-base neutralization reactions uh, happen in a very systematic way for all of them. Uh, and this verbiage right here, if you memorize this, will really help you. And if you just say acid plus base yields salt plus water. Uh, and this is, of course, a neutral salt that stays in solution. Why? Because the ions were dissolved before. Are they precipitating out? No, because we know they're soluble anyway. Okay, hydrogen is the cation for any acid. So, of course, uh, that's not really going to precipitate out with anything. Um, so, you can write acid plus base yields neutral salt plus water, right? Sorry, I just like to say liquid. Okay, the main product of an acid-base reaction is water. Okay, the net ionic equation for any acid-base reaction is just your H plus aqueous plus OH minus aqueous yields H2O liquid. Okay, that is your net ionic equation for any all total... I was going to say the word totality, and I'm like, that's definitely not what I'm going for. Uh, the total amount of acid-base reactions in the world, H plus aqueous plus OH minus aqueous yields H2O liquid will be your net ionic reaction. So let's do an example problem uh, where we go through this. Uh, a solution of perchloric acid reacts with a solution of barium hydroxide. Now, I'm giving you a strong acid, strong base reaction, Okay. Recall that if we have that IC suffix on the end of an acid, that it came from the anion, right, with an ATE ending. So if we chop off the IC, add an ATE, we see perchlorate. We know that's ClO4, 1 minus, right, or just ClO4 minus. Um, so to make that an acid, we just tack an H onto it. So we have HClO4 aqueous plus Ba. OH2 aqueous, and if you're wondering why it's OH2, I cannot win. There we go. Uh, if you're wondering why it's OH2, it's because barium is a 2 plus cation. Yields, right? What am I doing? Undo. Sorry, I wanted to say something before we did this. Okay, so this is going to look a lot like a double replacement reaction to you. And in this case, it actually is. In some situations, it won't be. Um, so, actually, no. It, it usually always is. I'm talking about, like, a very small division of exceptions. So don't even worry about that. Strike it. Um, I would use the power of editing, but it kind of really only lets you do the video in one shot. So I do not want to lose information or lecture notes because I was being vain about what I said or sounding stupid because everyone makes verbiage mistakes all the time. So it's okay. Um, 
hey, public service announcement, there does need to be a 2 in front of HClO4. Uh, so now we can do our reaction, and our neutral salt is barium perchlorate. And it stays in solution, right? Soluble goes to soluble. Plus, right, our 2H2O. Right? Now, this is where I'm really going to drive the point home about why the anionic reaction is water. Um, because everything's aqueous, and the only thing that changes phase is water goes to liquid. Right? So that little L right there is what dictates that this is a, an actual reaction, and B, that this is the species that's highlighted in the net ionic. So let's write out our complete ionic reaction um, for practice, right? So we have our 2H plus aqueous plus 2ClO4 minus aqueous. Cannot win with these. At some point, you'd think that writing aqueous so many times gets easier. It doesn't. Uh, plus Ba2 plus aqueous plus 2OH minus aqueous yields, right? And now, weird, we're going our barium 2 plus aqueous again plus our 2ClO4 minus aqueous again now plus our 2H2O liquid, right? So anything that's not involved in the formation of water is left out of the net ionic reaction again. So we can go and write it. Again, just because it's good practice. Now, public service announcement. For example, if you have 2H plus plus 2AH, oh, bleh, 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 bleh. 2H plus plus 2OH minus yields 2H2O, it technically should be reduced. Since they're all two, you can just take all the coefficients off. I'm going to write it that way first. Right, really, um, really, your numbers should be the lowest whole number ratio. If the lowest whole number ratio is one, then you should write it as one. Depends on your professor's personal preference. Uh, if I was teaching the course, I the first time a student did it, I'd be kind of like, yeah, no, don't do that. But like, I get where you're coming from. Yes, two moles makes two moles makes two moles, but you can write that as one mole, one mole, one mole to make your life easier, so you should. Um, I don't really know how I would handle that point-wise, but ask your professors if there's any ambiguity before a test if they want the lowest whole number ratio. I definitely would, but that is not mine to say because this is just an informative lecture video, right? So what can we conclude about the neutral or net ionic, rea net, net ionic reaction for all acid-base neutralizations? We're going to write it again because it's that important, right? And we're going to write it super big. Right? Super big. Because it's that important, that that's always the net ionic reaction for an acid-base neutralization. So if you're given a test question on an acid-base neutralization and they ask you to write an ionic reaction and you're not starting with H+, you're doing something wrong. Please check yourself. Um, so anyway, let's move on. Uh, just a really short blurb about combustion reactions. I'm not going to talk about it a ton because it's something you talk about a lot in reaction stoichiometry in Chapter 3 of your General Chemistry 1 course. Um, so we're just going to kind of move through this pretty quickly. Um, you know, you, you have your, your fuel plus oxygen yields salt or yields carbon dioxide and water. Sorry, I'm saying acid base salt water again. Um, let's just do the octane example. So we have our C8H18 plus O2. Oh, we're going to call that a liquid actually. O2 gas yields CO2 gas plus H2O liquid. Now, there's no net ionic, complete ionic, because they're not ions, right? So this is a hydrocarbon. What does hydrocarbon mean? That there's hydrogen and carbon, and that's it, right? 
It's a liquid, but it's an organic molecule, right? So we don't have any metals. There's no metal-nonmetal interaction here, so there's no ionics happening. Um, for you balancing nerds, go balance that. Okay, we're back. Um, turns out this is actually a pretty big molar ratio reaction, and I should rewrite this because this was really messy. 2C8H18 liquid plus 25O2 gas. There it is. Yield 16CO2 plus 18H2O. So if you got that right balancing-wise, good job getting practice. That's all I'm going to say about combustion reactions. Um, fuel plus oxygen yields carbon dioxide and water, fuel being a hydrocarbon. Uh, if you have other stuff, for example, um, if you burn, you know, some type of ionic compound, right, still what's going to happen is you're going to be letting off gaseous products. You'll use um, gas miscibility rules, which you will not interact with in this course at all. So do not worry about that. All you have to know for combustion is hydrocarbon uh, added to oxygen, giving you carbon dioxide and water. The last part of this video is going to talk about a different type of reaction, uh, and it's called an oxidation reduction reaction, or redox. And redox reactions, uh, the big deal with this is you're actually uh, transferring electrons from one cation to another, uh, or, or should I, I should say one species to another. Not necessarily a cation every time, my bad. Um, the big deal with this, okay, and the big deal that a lot of people have trouble with this is they don't understand that chemistry is a tug of war for electrons. And that is something that my general chemistry one professor said, and general chemistry two professor said countless times, um, because it really is true. Um, and I was negligent in saying it until now, or not negligent, I guess, uh, I neglected to say it until now. Um, because I wanted an example where I could really show you how electrons were moving around and why that invigorates a reaction. Okay, so uh, there are two processes going on in a redox reaction at any time. Oxidation, which is the loss of electrons or the increase of the charge of a metal. Uh, reduction is the gain of electrons or the decrease or reduction, huh, right, because it's going down, of the charge of the metal. So we always say things in reference to the cation here. Um, and those cations are always metals, right? Because metal, non-metal makes ionic compound. Um, if you are, if this is your first chemistry course of your life, this will be a new acronym to you. If you've had a chemistry course before, um, you'll 99.9% .9 chance that you've heard oil rig before. Uh, this is an acronym we use to help students remember, uh, how electrons move in the processes of oxidation and reduction. So I'll write out the acronym here for you. Uh, oil. So we have oxidation. is, wow, I should not rewrite the L, is loss, and I'm actually going to rewrite oxidation because that's messy, right, oxidation is loss, and then, right, so if oxidation is loss, reduction, R-I-G, right, reduction is gain. I started to write a G. Right, remember that whenever we use these acronyms, we're referencing the movement and loss and gain of electrons, right? So electrons, chemistry is a tug of war for electrons. We're using that, right? So the species that's oxidized, okay, will have a higher charge on the product side than the charge it had on the reactant side, right? So if we have a reaction where we have a metal in a solid state goes to, let's say, metal halide, right, in the aqueous state, and it reacts with something else, right? Here, it had a charge of zero. Here, it had a charge of plus, right? So increasing charge. The species that's reduced will have a higher charge on the reactant side than on the product side. So let's say that we go the other way, right? We have MX on this side plus something else, right? We have a plus and then we have the M solid, right? So when our charge is going down, we're being reduced, adding electrons. When our charge is going up, we're being oxidized, electrons are coming away. Okay, and this will make a lot more sense on a practice problem that we have two of on the next couple pages, and then we're done. Um, 
in every redox reaction, right, we have both processes occurring simultaneously. So we can kind of attribute the causation of these processes to the actual species gaining or losing the electrons, right? So uh, we have names for uh, the different species, uh, depending on whether they're being oxidized or reduced. And we call so we can invigorate either of the two processes, right? So of course, one of these is going to be oxidizing. Why did I switch to black? Oxidizing and reducing, right? So our oxidizing agent, the agent or the species that's causing the other species to lose electrons, right, is the species being reduced, right? Right? So the species that's gaining electrons has to take them from somewhere. It takes them away from the, species, from the other species, and in turn, that species is being oxidized. Okay? The reducing agent then... Oh, sorry. I gave it away. Right? So the oxidizing agent is the species being reduced. The reducing agent is the species being oxidized because it is causing the other process to happen on the other species. Right? And this is a very quick overview of redox. We are not going to balance redox reactions today. I don't... For, well, for the course that, um, that I'm involved with, we don't balance redox reactions. Uh, if you're coarse, you do balance redox reactions. Um, whether I will make a video on that or not, I'm not sure. Likely not, unless they add it into the curriculum that I'm involved with teaching. Um, you know, so if so, woo, if not, it's painful. So Khan Academy that as fast as you can. Uh, it, it is hard. Um, so we're going to consider this hypothetical reaction between solid man magnesium metal and zinc chloride. Right? So you're going to notice that this looks a lot like what we did on the first page called a single replacement reaction, right? <coughs> Excuse me. Wow. Right? So we have a lone A. So we have our A plus BC yields AC plus B, right? So that's the same regular kind of format we use for single replacement. Um, but this time, it's actually redox because we're changing charges, right? So, actually, by and large, this the single replacement reaction we used, it, it was a redox reaction. I just didn't tell you. Uh, <laughs> I took redox reaction formats off the first page because it was so hard to, like, write an example reaction and say, wait 40 minutes. We'll talk about it later. Um, but anyway, uh, let's take this reaction as an example. Um, and let's just really quickly write the charges of the metals down on both sides, right? So magnesium is zero. It's going to two plus. Zinc is two plus. It's going to zero, right? So I gave you this nice little bracketed area to write down your charges in so we can make conclusions, right? The charge of magnesium on the reactant side is zero. The charge of magnesium on the product side is two plus, right? So... We are losing electrons because we're increasing charge. Okay, therefore, magnesium is oxidized, right? The charge of zinc on the reactant side is 2 plus. The charge of zinc on the product side is 0, so therefore, zinc is reduced, okay? Now, there is a problem... Uh, with how this is written and typed, and I wanted to talk about this, so I intentionally typed it wrong. Um, you'll notice that the species, right, on the reactant side that's being reduced is actually zinc 2+, plus, because it is an ion, right? We're adding electrons, we're bringing it out of aqueous solution, out of its ionic state into a solid state as a metal, Right? We talk about the species being oxidized and reduced based on their state and relative ionic charge, or if they're solid, there's no charge, um, that they have on the reactant side of the equation only because that's what we're starting with, right? So we can't really say that zinc metal is reduced because it's not going to an anion, right? It, it, that does not happen. Let's clarify. That does not happen, okay? Zinc 2 plus is reduced to a zero charge zinc. Magnesium solid is oxidized to a magnesium 2 plus uh, uh, cation. Sorry, I started to say anion both times, and I was like, no, um, it wasn't going to happen. So, again, so we've, we've corrected it down here, right? 
So technically, you do need to put Zn2 plus is reduced. Okay, magnesium is oxidized. Zn2 plus is reduced. Okay. So, we now compile all the information in this lovely little area on the bottom of the page. Right? So, we're asked, uh, what species is oxidized? Find it. Boom. Mg is oxidized. So, you can just say Mg. Right? What species is reduced? This is where you have to say Zn2 plus is reduced. I'm actually going to write those a little more separately. Not that far zoomed in, but okay. Mg, Zn2 plus. What is the oxidizing agent? Remember, the oxidizing agent is the species being reduced. So you just find the species being reduced right there, zinc2 plus, and just write it again. And that leaves um, Mg to be the reducing agent. So let's do a practice redox question and call it a day. Um, we're going to actually do a reaction that all of you know, whether you've seen it written down on paper or not. Um, well, hopefully all of you know, right? So we're considering the reaction in which iron three oxide is formed. Iron three oxide is all together now. Rust, yay, okay, we know how rust happens, right? So solid iron gets oxidized with oxygen in the air. Now there's two, way for some, two ways for something to be oxidized. The charge can go up or you're literally adding oxygen, oxidized oxygen adding, okay, yes. Now in this situation, actually it's both, so the charge is changing, so we have an, an increase or decrease in charge of both those species and we're adding oxygen, super exciting. Um, in organic chemistry, it's creating more carbon oxygen bonds. Um, and something else that I can't remember. So consult your organic professor if that's the case. But anyway, um, we're gonna consider the reaction in which iron three oxide is formed. Um, so it's already balanced for you. <laughs> Look at how nice that is. Um, and this is a very good way to actually mirror an exam question, right? So let's figure out which species is being oxidized, reduced, oxidizing agent, reducing agent. And then we'll also do it like kind of a tug of war of electrons question, um, just to kind of show you that that is really what's happening, right? So the charge on iron uh, on the reactant side is zero, charge on oxygen on the reactant side is zero. So that's actually kind of easy, right? So whichever one goes up is inherently being oxidized. Whichever one's going down is inherently being reduced. And it's a lot easier to see because we're starting at zero. So cool, right? So Fe2O3. So if we have Fe2O3, right? Now I'm so nice and I actually told you it was iron three. Um, but if we had Fe2O3, right, we know oxi oxide is a 2 minus. That means we'd have a 6 minus charge on oxygen. We have two irons to split up that 6 minus charge on, so we'd have to have 3 plus on either iron. Okay, so anyway, um, right, so we have, I want to write it on the bottom. We have 3 plus on iron and 2 minus on oxygen, right? So it's actually kind of really easy to see between these two, right? that iron is being oxidized, oxygen is being reduced, right? Which species is the oxidizing agent? Oxygen, which species is the reducing agent? Actually, I'll go the extra mile. Um, whether you have to do this on an exam or not, um, it, it's really at the discretion of your professor. You don't always have to write in states. Uh, not, neither of them are ions, so you can kind of just write O or O2. You don't really necessarily have to write O2. Um, I choose to because it's the most accurate way I can portray the information to you guys. Um, since many of you are probably using this as either a review or a lecture style uh, video, that's kind of how I want to give it to you that way. Um, but this is fun, right? So how many electrons were transferred between the two species, right? So here's where you're really going to see the whole chemistry is a tug of war for electrons, electron transfer, you know, mumbo jumbo, you're like, what are you talking about? I'll show you, right? So there's four iron atoms. I can write that way nicer. I feel bad. Four iron atoms, much better, right? Times three electrons lost per iron atom. Right? Now, this just tells me, right, 
that there's 12 electrons lost. What happened? 12 electrons lost by iron. Right? Now, here's where you're going to be like, whoa, it's crazy, right? We have six oxygen atoms, right, times two electrons gained per oxygen atom, right? So then 12 electrons was gained by oxygen, right? So the answer to this question would be 12 electrons, right? And that really goes to show you, right, that in any way that this could happen, uh, the exact amount of electrons that are lost by your uh, species being oxidized is the exact amount of electrons gained by your species being reduced. And chemistry being a tug of war of electrons um, this speed, this process here, this oxidation reduction simultaneous reaction process is really important. Um, so in any way, shape or form, uh, I hope this video helped you out, uh, with understanding reactions. Um, obviously, uh, this doesn't substitute out for any of your professor's lectures, uh, nor does this kind of serve as a, a, quote unquote, better lecture because it's more consolidated, but this is just another information source for you to use uh, to expand your knowledge about chemistry, whether that's for uh, a fun pastime or for class. Uh, I appreciated uh, you listening to even any part of this video. Um, please check out my other chemistry videos if you have other questions or other things you want to look at. Um, I do have guided videos for all chapters of content material for General Chemistry 1, so feel free to take a look at that if that suits you. Um, otherwise, uh, have a great day and remember your safety goggles.